So first off, I, I'd like to just open it up to questions as we go along. You know, if something comes up and it's just sort of on your mind, just you know, feel free to raise your hand. I think that might make this a little more dynamic and engaged. Um, so just some overview stuff. I'm presenting, I'm sort of uh, facilitating these Enviro DIY sensor stations being deployed throughout the Delaware Basin, kind of facilitating developing uh, manuals to go along with uh, directing folks on how to build these things, how to install them, and then how to manage them afterwards in terms of just upkeep and maintenance as well as uh, for specific monitoring purposes. Okay, so just to, to point out a few people here, Shannon Hicks is kind of like the source of this whole deal of these sensor stations. She designed this Mayfly data logger board, designed this uh, overall basic sensor station setup, um, and you know, super smart electrical engineer has just been doing this process of, of developing doodads for monitoring in all kinds of situations, um, water being one of them. Okay? Dave R. Scott, executive director of Stroud, he's kind of uh, pretty focused on these sensor stations. It's kind of a new thing. I'll talk about this a little later, but th these stations have been used internally at Stroud for a number of years for actual just like internal research purposes. It's only been in the last couple of years that they've been uh, taking directions towards putting these out kind of outside of Stroud, and that's really what this Delaware River Watershed Initiative deal is about, where we're working with groups, um, some of you are in here, Jim, Jim. <laughs> um, it, it putting these out with watershed groups and sort of uh, supporting these groups in using the stations uh, for specific monitoring purposes, okay? Um, we have uh, several texts on this. Uh, Sarah Damiano is a, a programmer working with programming these boards, developing programs uh, according to different sensors to hook up to these station, the, these uh, Mayfly boards. Tara Menz is in education, and that's, that's me. Okay, so um, before we get into uh, the slides, I just want to go through these pictures here. This is sort of the standard uh, sensor station that we're putting out uh, with, with the Delaware River Watershed Initiative. Enviro DIY is sort of a broader type deal that it's, it's kind of an open open source uh, community of individuals who are working with all kinds of things like this. We'll go to that website here in a second. I think I think I can navigate to a website. Um, so there's all kinds of different uh, configurations of these things with, with this kind of as the central figure, but then running all kinds of different sensors out of here for on land or in water. Okay, so that's the broader situation. More specific with DRWI, it's this setup. So this is the sort of basic package with the uh, Pelican box as the, oh shoot, it's foiling me. Um, so CTD sensor, conductivity, temperature, depth, turbidity sensor, okay? Solar panel, protective weatherproof box, Mayfly board, that little red thing there is a um, cell module so that these stations, when they collect data, send it to a website and the data are presented real time. That's a real kind of key feature of these things, okay? Otherwise, they're basically just your standard logger where you go out and you download the data from this thing and then you look at it. So that's all like looking at historic data, whereas the real time capacity, I think, is particularly useful for monitoring and education. It's more engaging, it's kind of here and now, and it also allows you to really pinpoint, in terms of monitoring, pinpoint time, timing of uh, going out to do additional monitoring of your stream. Okay, so there's the Mayfly data logger board, Arduino software, Arduino language, we'll get into that a little bit. This is sort of a basic station setup with logger, board, logger boxes up here. 
wires run down over the stream bank to the sensors that are <coughs> mounted in the stream on the stream bob. There's the close-up logger box, the solar panel, generally facing south. And then here's the sensors kind of mounted in the stream bed. We'll go through details of all these different things um, a bit. And then we're generally putting a staff gauge out to go along with it. Some of this relates to uh, developing rating curves, which we'll get into. Um, OK, so uh, before I move on from this introductory slide, uh, I want to just see how many uh, how many folks are in here are like involved in some sort of monitoring context, stream monitoring context? Okay, how many are involved in like more specific kind of education context? Okay. Um, all right. How, how many folks in here even have have heard of this sort of term and know sort of Stroud and what Stroud's sort of doing along these lines? All right, okay. Um, so moving on. This is just, I kind of went over all these intentions, talking about Enviro DIY broadly, and then in the Delaware River Watershed Initiative context, um, going through just details of these sensor stations. You know, giving, hopefully giving folks an idea here, really, of how these things function, the data coming off of them, maintenance, upkeep, that type of thing. And then, what Stroud's doing right now in terms of supporting usage of these sensor stations, um, you know, uh, facilitating building of monitoring capacity, education capacity among these watershed groups in the in the Delaware River Basin. Okay, um, and then we are these are coming available for private purchase. We're deploying them through this DRWI grant, and then there's some other kind of more situational grants where people are getting these. Um, so one thing to emphasize here, there's a ton of slides in here. I'm probably gonna end up skipping through some, being very brief. You're gonna have access to this presentation afterwards as well as it's being recorded. So this presentation is not only intended to serve as like for here and now, but also it can serve as sort of a reference, which is in part why some of the slides are pretty detailed. Okay. Um, so uh, let's see. Should I? I'm going to try to click on this. Let's see if we can go to the Enviro DIY. If this works. Okay. So this is the Enviro DIY website. Okay. This is a lot of like semi-random people who are involved in this. This is facilitated by Stroud Center, but it's not like Stroud is sitting there and kind of overseeing every little activity that's going in there, okay? It's an open source. Welcome to Enviro DIY, a community for do-it-yourself environmental science and monitoring. Enviro DIY is part of Wiki Watershed, okay? So Wiki Watershed is this web toolkit designed to help citizens, conservation practitioners, and municipal municipal decision makers, researchers, educators, and students advance knowledge and stewardship of fresh water. Okay. Wiki Watershed is this toolkit that Stroud has developed. There's various things, uh, Leaf Pack Network, um, Model My Watershed, folks I'm sure have heard of Model My Watershed. Um, so this, this website is just set up just to go through this quickly. There's this about Enviro DIY. So this kind of is just a description of the basic setup. Um, go to community. There's different groups in here, okay? So there's a teacher's group. I think, you know, for instance, Jim Coffey, if he was here, I think is part of this. But there's different groups on here that you can be a part of and communicate about uh, this Enviro DIY stuff, okay? Mayfly board, okay? So the Mayfly board is a data logger board. Um, it, um, it's pretty high functioning. Shannon's very proud of it. It's just it's a very powerful board. It's a lot more powerful than some of these other ones. These are Arduino specific boards. Jim. Are you going to point out you can buy it from Amazon? Yes. Yes. <laughs> I have a couple slides on that actually. So thank you. I appreciate that. Um, there's a blog here, okay, which has <coughs> updates on just kind of things going on. This one here, I can click on that. This is a recent uh, this is a recent article that was put out. This is based on data collected from the sensor stations. 
Um, so you see here, like the, the conductivity, conductivity is closely related to chloride levels, okay? Chloride road salt, okay? So in the winter time, we see this type of thing in urban areas particularly. Spike in conductivity with depth. So blue here is depth, the red is conductivity, okay? So road salts wash off and cause these spikes in the in the conductivity, okay? So the, this, the real time capacity here just gives you an ongoing record of when these conductivity spikes occur. And so it gives you, and we'll talk about this a little later, but it gives you direct kind of knowledge of length of time of exposure and extent of exposure. Okay? That is a wintertime activity. You see the opposite pattern in the summertime, whereas rain comes off, it dilutes. Okay. Um, so there's the there's uh, there's this forums. Okay. Again, discussion area. Um, so that's about all for Enviro DIY. I'm going to close out of there. And then um, let's continue through this. This is a little detailed, but um. So as I mentioned, the Enviro DIY sensor stations. Um, the Mayfly data logger board is kind of the center kind of fixture that allows this whole thing to happen. Um, as I mentioned, the, the standard DRWI sensor station configuration is with the logger box, a solar panel, CTD, and turbidity sensor. Okay? There are other configurations that are possible. These are a little less standardized right now, We're kind of just hoping to be able to move uh, more completely to that. Some of these sensors are very expensive, dissolved oxygen, for instance. Um, and then I've pretty much gone over uh, all of this, just Stroud Center's involvement with Enviro DIY facilitated by Stroud Center, Shannon Hicks. Um, as I mentioned, this, the, these sensor stations have been uh, internal to Stroud. Shannon's just sort of tinkering about and making, you know, a researcher wants this type of thing to be monitored, so she kind of tinkers around and builds something, and so it's just gotten to a point where it's it's a, it, it's a uh, refined enough process that they're starting to put these things out and make them available externally, okay? Um, so, and as I also mentioned, uh, just some of the organizations involved, Penn Foundation, uh, there's an EPA project going on, Sustainable Business Network, recently uh, got some of these, We're working with Trout Unlimited uh, in Michigan, as well as Idaho to put these out. And then, as I mentioned, there's, uh, private purchase of these available on kind of a case-by-case -case basis, okay? Um, so just getting into some um, uh, more visual type stuff, these are all kind of like some of these different iterations that I ta was talking about. You know, putting these on in kind of weir type situations on small streams, building a weir so that you can monitor in a small stream, okay? Um, there's this type of thing, these just very base level using a sensor. This is just a simple, cheap sensor. You can just hook right directly to that. You know, like Shannon sometimes will just hook one of these, a temperature sensor up here and just monitor in her house, you know, just to see about drafts and this type of thing. Um, this is the range finder. So this is in situations where you might not be able to submerge the sensor. Um, in the water where there's a, and I have some other pictures of this, but there's a range finder right here. Oh, dang it. <laughs> Looking down, and it's just measuring distance from here to here. So that gives you it's just all, ultrasonic. Ultrasonic, ultrasonic. And I have some a actual pictures of that here in a bit. Here's a rain gauge, okay? Mayfly board is in there, in a little protective case with a solar panel. See the solar <coughs> panel there? Um, this is one down in sort of a bay type area. Um, this is groundwater monitoring down there in a well. Um, this is a, uh, you know, a, a discharge deal. Uh, Sontec type, you mount these on the stream bottom. Um, this is sort of the standard. This is from one of our recent deployments. There's a uh, CTD sensor, turbidity sensor. This is a little doodad. It, Mayfly board is here behind it. This is a little doodad we use to check 
cell signal. And we go out to, to do reconnaissance for positioning these stations. So this you can see here, signal 0%. Um, that means you couldn't get, you couldn't have a station there that, that you had online data. Okay, so we just use that in, in reconnaissance, but that again is based on this Mayfly board. Okay, so Enviro DIY pretty much already went through this. Uh, Arduino based. Okay, so Arduino there is an official Arduino board made by an Arduino company, but as I understand it. Um, but there's also it's also open source. So there's also so there's like Arduino software. There's Arduino language. Okay, the Mayfly board uses Arduino coding, um, but other than that, it's not really associated with with Arduino. Um, so and as I mentioned, uh, the, the Enviro DIY that community that's on there right now is pretty tech oriented. Okay, because there's not a lot of there's direct access to code and stuff like that, and there's direct access to people that are, are in the communities to, to talk, but it's a lot of pretty techy people. Um, the idea is to continue to develop manuals and support materials to allow folks that may not be programmers in their main job to have access to potentially building these stations, installing them, or, any, or to basically access at whatever level they're comfortable with. Okay, um, went through that. Uh, pretty much already talked about this. The Stroud Center support uh, in terms of Delaware River Watershed Initiative, comprehensive facilitation. Build, we build and code the station, <coughs> we install the station, and then provide guidance for management and upkeep um, with these stations. Where there's a uh, post installation manual that's being finalized right now that includes all the different maintenance you need to do with these things, troubleshooting, um, and that includes also uh, like how, how to use the data for monitoring. Okay, um, as I mentioned, there's uh, limited situational private purchases available, um, and as I mentioned, also that we're, we're developing additional guidance to, to <coughs> help that along to allow broader audience. Yes. Um, how much uh, specific programming do you have to do? I would have thought that it was fairly straightforward for most of the, the data collection. Maybe the analysis part I can see. Programming, it's, it's programming of the board for particular sensors. Okay? So that's what I'm talking about when I'm saying about the coding. It's, it's, re it's related to actually just conditioning this board so that it will accommodate, you know, the type of sensor, but more specifically, the particular sensor. Okay, so you could you can potentially just put whatever sensor you on there be on there you want. You just have to work out the code. So right now, the code for the CTD and the Trividity, for instance, are pretty standard and accessible, and those are can be found on the Enviro DIY website. Okay, Jim. I was going to say you don't really have to be a programmer. Say you wanted to change the timing interval, you just go in the code and change a number and Yeah, it depends it. on what you call yeah. being a coder. Yeah. You know? I don't want to change that. Ideally ideally there's there will be, you know, directions on all of this. Right now there's not really clear like directions for folks who may just be coming to that, that realm of things, you know, for their first shot. Um, and, and the coding is that much different for each individual installation? Not each of the, I mean, not for DRWI, but for each of those different kind of set types of sensors, yeah. it, it you know you certainly have to just condition the board for that <coughs> program the board for that particular type of sensor. And I think that that is already done. I don't think once it's installed for the Delaware River Watershed Initiative, it's all we're already we're we're basically just it's all set, mm -hmm. and we just are putting them out. And the group is basically, we're working with the groups to just manage the station, <coughs> to keep the data good, you know, to keep the data so that it's accurate. You know, the turbidity sensor, for instance, fouls a lot. So you have to sort of manage that and be aware of that and go out during storms in particular. If you want good turbidity data, go out there and actually clean the sensor during the storm. So that, that pulse of turbidity, you know, is shown during the storm the real the real turbidity as opposed to the turbidity that may be inaccurate due to 
a, a couple of leaves just sitting on there. So, um, okay, so now we'll get into uh, uh, some, some more details. Um, so I guess one reason why these sensor stations are um, pr pretty nice to have is just simply the cost. Okay, so the Mayfly board is much, much cheaper than uh, some of these commercial type loggers. Okay, so you're looking at, you know, something like this for these commercial loggers. Okay, so this is the thing that you're connecting the sensors to. Okay, well, these. Um, okay, you go to the Mayfly situation with the board, the box, battery, SD card and adapter, solar panel, cell modules, and you're looking in this range. Okay, so that's part of the reason why these are it depends relative, but you know these are relatively inexpensive. The CTD and turbidity um, setup is about twenty five hundred bucks to just purchase. Okay, um, so one other thing here: most of the cost in these stations, in that twenty five hundred that I mentioned, is just the sensors. So the turbidity sensor costs about twelve hundred bucks, and the CTD, CTD about. I think it's six to eight or something like What's that. What's the average lifespan of those sensors? Uh, that's a good question. I mean, it's... It, you don't know yet, maybe? Uh, it, I mean, it, it, it's semi-indefinite. It, it really depends on wear and tear. Okay. You know, I mean... Well, good question. I didn't how, what's the stuff. lifespan? Oh. So, you know, it, 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 if nothing goes wrong, mm -hmm. it can be years, okay. you know, but I mean, we certainly have situations where a flood comes through and a boulder comes down and takes, takes it out, or, or there's, you know, every now and again, there's a defective sensor. Usually we can send those back for free and get them replaced, but there's just, you know, there's definitely just, this is, these are pretty dramatic environments sometimes where these, where these are placed, and you get these giant flows coming through. And that's powerful stuff. You've got these two little things in the, anchored in the stream bottom. A lot can happen. Now, they've been pretty resilient. We only had a couple over this winter with these big ice things and <coughs> moving around and this and that. So one of my people, I, I coordinate mass watershed stewards, and one of them oh, was yeah, doing, right, I think right. it was two of yours in Berks County under the conservation district. And he said one of those was, was damaged over the winter. That's that Kent. Time. That's Kent's idea. Yes. Yeah. Well, yeah. Okay. They're pretty rugged. Actually, I had a beaver upset one of them. The DIY mm -hmm. went underwater, and I dried it off, and it worked fine. Yeah, it's supposed <laughs> to be perfectly waterproof, you know. Have you had any problems with vandalism? Yes. Mm. Not real regularly, but we have had a few cases where it was to pretty much totally destroyed. Now, both of those cases, they actually didn't take the sensors. <laughs> I mean, so it wasn't a lot of save. It wasn't a lot of money lost in terms of equipment, but then that means you have to redo the whole thing. In so that's a lot of time, you know, in terms of getting a new station put together and then going out and setting it up. It's a, you know, it's a couple days worth of time. So. Do you calibrate the sensor initially or on a regular basis if that's some sort of regulatory quality sensor? Um, so these are regulatory quality sensors. They're factory calibrated and they're not supposed to need calibration. What we're recommending is to have, you know, a multimeter probe or a little handheld probe, whatever, that, that you calibrate on your own, you know, and to check against these, you know. So it, it's going to depend on really what your intentions are for the data. The, the, you know, the, the, the more important the data are, the more you're going to want to check against really, like, instruments that are, you're, you're sure that they're calibrated. <coughs> but, but these sensors are, you know, pretty high grade sensors, so they're, they're not, they're not supposed to need calibration. Okay, so if you wanted to bring the cost down further by using a lower cost sensor, is that a thing that people do? I mean, that's certainly a thing that is possible, you know, for anyone to do if they're willing to get in there and work with the code for that particular sensor on, you know, getting that put onto the Mayfly board. We're, for instance, exploring options for a lower cost turbidity sensor right now. Um, you know, Sarah, who I mentioned earlier, is working on just testing that out and seeing how it works, confirming that it's, it works right, because it's kind of a new turbidity sensor, so she's basically just testing it out. But the good thing about that is it's cheaper, it has a wiper, 
So meaning it, it'll wipe off algae accumulation and stuff like that. And it also has a, I mean, that Campbell turbidity sensor, it, you know, it needs about that much space from its, I'll show a picture of the, you know, the way it looks, but it shoots out and measures reflect, you know, reflection of off of particles. It needs about 15, 18 inches. Whereas this new one they're testing is like this. Where that comes into play is like where you can put this thing in a stream and how deep you can go. So, you know, and possibly being able to then with that short, with that narrower field of vision, possibly being able to put a protection around it to, to ward off leaves and that type of thing. Because the wiper's not going to work on the leaves anyways. So, anyway. Um, so, this is just sort of some background on these types of boards. This is, Ardu this is an Arduino Uno. They apparently don't make this anymore. There's some newer version. Um, you know, when Shannon was first starting out with these, I think she used this and then maybe moved to this and, and this. This is a later version. This is kind of a spin-off of this Arduino. It's a Chinese brand. Um, you know, this type of progression adding on these shields for additional capacity back in the day and moving towards this where you don't even need to add shields other than this B board, this, this cell board. Um, it's all built in here into the Mayfly board. So these are just some stats, you know, just it, the Mayfly board is just a lot more powerful than, for instance, that Arduino board. So, um, this is kind of just, again, the progression. Shannon's been working through multiple, you know, revisions. And this will continue just as, you know, just the process. Here's a kind of just a diagram. Um, so I should, we're at noon right now. We have till 12.30, right? So, mm -hmm. right, now. All right, so I should probably. All right, so just to point out a few features here. <coughs> There's a, there's a better diagram with a better legend later. Power switch. Um, th th this is where that, that uh, B module goes. Um, this, this is where the, the, your micro SD card goes. Um, here's the microprocessor, the brains. Um, these are where the sensors are attached. Okay. Um, these are kind of the important. Here's the, these boards are available on Amazon, okay? You can buy just a board. It is in, they, they are in stock right now. Um, they, they run out fairly quickly. I mean, Stroud is basically just doing this to make them accessible. It, it's, Stroud's not really making money on this. Um, there's, all, there's also uh, this little kit which comes as this, with this protective box, a USB cord, some uh, growth adapters for sensors, two micro SD cards, an adapter, the Mayfly board, and a solar panel. Okay, so this is for someone just who would just want to start out. Is that the main stock right now, too? What's that? Is that in stock, boss? Yes. No lithium battery, though. No lithium battery. You can't shift lithium batteries. Just buy that on your own. Um, <clears throat> okay, uh, this is pretty much all stuff I've already said. Arduino compatible hardware couple, couple to commercially available sensors or DIY sensors, okay? So the idea here is the more you learn about this board and coding and that type of thing, the more you can do with different types of sensors. Here's some, you know, just the list of sensors that you could use. Soil moisture, you know, conductivity, redox, CO2, water depth, DO. Here's our Campbell turbidity, and here's our CTD sensor. So the soil my farmers could use that. Yeah, and I've got a few pictures with some data, and we do have some farmers that are using that. I'll show you. I'll show you one of the. I'm sorry. How much are the oxygen sensors? They're expensive. They're like a couple thousand. Um, other, you know, I showed this um, rain gauge, multi probe. There's the range finder, Jim. Oh, you know, it's just a very simple thing. Um, so, 
here's, here's just the first kind of comprehensive deal here with the data. This is Upper Rocky Run, and um, it uh, flows into First State National Historic Park off of the Concord Mall. Um, you can see here recently, um, this, is a, this goes up to 6,000 conductivity here. That's actually was a small pulse for this stream. If people are calibrated to conductivity, um, 6,000 is pr pretty ridiculously high. And yet this, this stream was, was spiking up to like 30,000 this winter. Um, yeah. Is that just a surrogate for road salt? Yeah. yeah. What? Is that primarily a surrogate for road salt? Yeah. 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 Um, I mean, it's not entirely. So that's about rating curves, and I'll get to that, and I really should move along here. But this is the, the, these, are, these are the basic data that you're getting. Water depth, you know, which is once you develop a discharge to depth rating curve, this is a surrogate for discharge, okay? Actual quantity of water moving over time. Conductivity, you know, everyone knows conductivity, I'm sure, but yes, this can serve as a surrogate for chloride looking at road salts. Here's your turbidity, and it's an NTUs. Um, here's your temperature. So there's a water temp, and there's also a logger temp. So this will get super high in the summer, because it even gets a little bit hotter than outside in here during the summer. And then this is your battery. Okay, So that, that's an important uh, part that you know to look at in troubleshooting situations. Data drops. OK, what was the battery level at when the data dropped out? Okay, battery level was hot was high, but the data still stopped. Okay, did cell did cell conductivity, you know, disappear or something? Okay, um, but here's just again some more kind of we've seen these. Um, so here's a um, photoactive radiation um, sensor. Here's data from that. Just an example of sort of some custom type options for these. Um, here's a, a groundwater monitoring situation. What was that specifically monitoring for? I mean, I think it was just monitoring simple stuff like conductivity and depth. Oh, is your conductivity, is that temperature compensated or do you have to do that? <coughs> no, it's, it's all set. Oh, I mean, um, oh wait. There's the rain rain gauge. That's, this is, you know, you can get these through Weather Underground now for, I guess, about 700 bucks, and it's online. So it's a nice, with these stations, some, there's a few folks that are pairing the CTD and turbidity station with one of these rain gauges, you know, nearby to sort of, you know, further kind of link those responses of precipitation to in-stream. Who's that one? Weather Underground? Weather Underground, yeah, yeah. Um, so here's the ultrasonic gem. Um, you know, it's just it's just another way to measure gap. Some folks, some of those uh, sustainable business network folks, um, put these in rain gardens. You couldn't have, you can't have a depth sensor in there because of right. so you're sort of measuring from above. Um, this is one in Bhutan, um, not this one. This one here. Um, where it's all the way up here and it's shooting down to the water. I think this was not, yeah. the people I talked to weren't even quite sure like why they went with this setup, if it was like a proof of concept thing or if it was an actual logistical thing with getting the sensor in here. It may have been just it was hard to access here so they put this in. Regardless, it's measuring water depth this way as opposed to being in the water. Okay, here's the soil moisture one. So there's, you know, like they're positioned at different levels in the soil. And here's the data. Okay, so you can't read that, but this is um, water and this is temp. Okay. Um, okay, so here's the, here's the sort of getting into the real time stuff. Um, as I mentioned, the, we're working with 2G network there. <coughs> really, the goal is for LTE. That's in development. Um, we really get pretty good 2G coverage, actually. 
It's about, for the DRWI situation, we're working at about 90%, 95% success with having 2G Is it coverage. Is cheaper, a lot cheaper than the 2G than LTE? Yeah. No, it's actually more expensive. <coughs> but the 2G service is about eight bucks a month, okay? There's also, the, the stations that are out at Stroud are on a radio network, and there's also a few out that are going through Wi-Fi, but then you have to be like right nearby. Yes, Raven. So just on that, with the ice flows, obviously that could like, you know, move things, but these sensors can survive if they're frozen solid? Well, that's a good question. So most of these, we try to put them low, down deep enough so that if ice does, frame, does form, the sensors themselves are below the ice level. If that's the case, then they're fine. The CTD sensor in particular is vulnerable, and in particular that, the, this little white disc in there that's the pressure transducer that measures depth, and that in particular is vulnerable to freezing if the ice freezes right around the sensor. We did have a few that it froze so quickly that they got encased in ice, and there were a few that did get damaged. So is there a minimum depth for this area that you recommend? I mean, at least, you know, four or five inches. You know, I mean, this winter got, it got so cold for that period that there were some that we thought, oh, geez, they're not at risk, and then it just keeps getting deeper and deeper, the ice, and it's like, oh, geez. If you really think about it, though, it was a double standard. I mean, to survive for most of the centuries, because number one, it wasn't just cold, it was the stream flow way low. Oh, yeah, yeah. So there was, you know, the, they were freezing very close to the bottom. Some were so solid. Yeah. So it, it was pretty, a pretty good survival. Okay, so this is for your reference. This is this, the sort of resources that Stroud is providing uh, for watershed groups, okay? So I'm not going to go through, I'm just going to go through the slides that relate to this, but this is sort of like for your purposes to just refer back if, you know, if, if you'd like. Um, okay, so same type of thing, just getting, you know, doing all this building and installation and, uh, you know, uh, supplemental kind of support, doing discharge measurements, collecting grab samples, providing gu guidance for that. There's our station again. Um, this is on the un an unnamed trip to Cobbs Creek. This is Darren Brake's uh, situation there. This is all, this is an urban stream. <coughs> it's, uh, if you follow my pointer, up in this region, <laughs> it's, uh, it's piped. So the whole upstream watershed above this is piped and he has a neat project where he's trying to get the community put in rain gardens um, wow. to take care of the flooding that's happening and to and to actually daylight the stream. Mm -hmm. Okay. The, those, the, the, gate, the staff gauge, yeah. you have like game cams to take pictures of it to correlate your... We have one gauge. group that has a that has a, a video out but that certainly is another just way to... Game cam yeah. up to take it every five minutes. Yeah. So this is again just for reference. This is getting into more details of this this setup. Okay. Again, this is the nice legend for for the Mayfly board with all the different things labeled and a little description of what you know the deal is there. Here's more of the just data that we're talking about. Um, these are just two kind of you know one pager type deals that we've been distributing. Some of you have seen this. Um, I think I'm running low on my battery on my pointer. Um, this is a general communication. This is sort of the DRWI process, okay? In terms of usage of the stations, John Jackson really likes to talk about this in his presentations. All of these questions, considering these prior to putting the station out. So, Reagan, you know, you're in a situation with um, Lauren, where you guys are just putting one of these stations upstream of this old mill dam area and one down and trying to just measure turbidity as you know it changes through that through that area. So you know you guys have already laid that out, you know, so you know exactly your intentions with the with the sensors. Um, so he, here's just another kind of just reference slide. You know, our our clusters, we have these stations throughout the, the basin at this point. Um, you know, developing monitoring capacity, um, supporting monitoring and education. Um, we've put out, we're, by, by June, we'll have put out about 60 of these throughout the basin, the Delaware Basin. Yes? Has, it, has any of these systems been used to show the effect of 
water from stormwater basins on highways into a particular stream? Yeah, I mean, Jim, you know, that's what he's going to be doing. With he, he's on Marsh Creek, and so he's positioning one kind of upstream of where this turnpike influence is coming in, and he's putting one downstream of it. So, you know, he, we're putting those out in a week or two. And, you know, that, that's the idea, for instance, with that, is to just do an upstream-downstream comparison. And that is all, it's, you know, nice to talk about, but when it comes to it, you really have to get in there and look at the data and really kind of possibly go and do additional samples to kind of confirm things. You know, so this is just, these data coming off of these sensors are really just, can be seen as a starting point of sorts for really just understanding the dynamics of your particular situation. Okay, so this is just a kind of a list of the different organizations that we're currently working with in the DRWI context. You know, I've, I've organized them here by cluster. Okay. Um, DR, that's William Penn, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. This is the list. We can't even <laughs> see it here, but <laughs> you can see it and you get the presentation. Um, so here's the actual locations of these things. Some of these aren't installed yet, some of them are. Um, these are Jacobs Creek right across the border in New Jersey. This is with Steve Tuorto with the Stony Brook Millstone Watershed Association. We have, we have four stations out in the Pickering watershed. Um, and these same sites listed on the Enviro DIY data portal. Okay. And these, you know, you can obviously use these links to just go exploring. Um, these are some just examples of streams we're working at and I'm going to just scroll through these you know this is with regard to BMPs temperature monitoring and uh, this is a reference station of sorts um, kind of like yours Jill a reference station of sorts um, Pickering sites this is that one in uh, Philly area this is, this is uh, monitoring upstream and downstream pipeline crossings. Um, <laughs> so we mentioned about field issues, you know, damage via, you know, anything, <laughs> rodents included. Um, these are just kind what of was that critter that was eating the wire? Is that a ferret? I don't know what it was. <laughs> <laughs> so here's, here's this uh, white pressure transducer that's uh, vulnerable to freezing. These are just, uh, there's the turbidity sensor, so it shoots out from this thing, you know. Um, <coughs> it's the SD card, micro SD card. Okay, it goes here, adapter for the computer, on the computer. Here's uh, Enviro DIY data portal plots. You know, just examples of these types of plots. One advantage with this is you can overlay different whatever you want here. You, know, you can put whatever you want into these graphs. Any of the data that you're collecting. Okay. Oh wait, whoops, I'm going the wrong way. Uh, okay, so that's that. Like, so other the so now I'm going to talk a little bit about like how we're supporting DRWI um, with these stations and with just sort of facilitating. Uh, transcending the learning curve. I mean, I think everyone involved in this, Stroud is not excluded from this. It's sort of building the ship as it's, you know, being driven. Um, so we're doing these workshops. Um, this introductory workshop, some of you have been to that. It sort of just goes through basics of coding, um, you know, deployment, QA, QC, and then looking at, at the data. So that's usually a one or two day event um, and then we have this, this kind of general process of maintaining the stations, doing supplemental sampling for the purpose of developing rating curves, and then actually using the rating curves along with the continuous data to uh, look at, to calculate loads of sediment of chloride, okay? Uh, potentially other things if you put proper sensors on, um, okay? So this is a workshop that's coming up. It's sort of a support workshop. It's for folks that are have had these stations out. So it's to help, it's to, you know, it's to present this new manual that we have and to go through some of this process of doing additional sampling to be to help to help make the sensor data basically more robust. 
Okay. So uh, we're working on a building manual. That would be you know something that folks could get, buy a basic kit, and then the manual would describe how to assemble the station as well as how to code the station. Okay. So this is GitHub, which is where the code is stored. Um, so that would be something, you know, the building component. That would be sort of a broader type thing that would be accessible to folks who might just purchase the station, want to just do the whole thing on their own. Okay? There's the installation manual. You build the station, then there's installation. So it's possible folks might want to buy the station already assembled, but then install it themselves. So this would this is intended to get at that. And these are just some photos of an installation. And reference those. Um, and then there's this post installation manual, which I guess I'll use pretty much the remaining 10 minutes on that. Um, talking about, it talks about maintenance and upkeep of these stations and then just facilitating using the data. So doing supplemental sampling, collecting grab samples to be analyzed, and doing discharge measurements. So doing discharge measurements across a storm or storms. Okay, so this is just some of the maintenance upkeeps type type stuff. Um, just a general little kit that we give folks. Um, I'm just going to skip through a lot of these. This pin is what allows the station to be. You can take it out of the stream and put it back, and it goes exactly to the same level via this pin. Okay, so there's a pipe within this, and then there's a PVC sheath onto which these sensors are attached. Okay, so you pull that sheath off, there's a hole there, so that you can put it back to the exact same level. Okay, this is just some more kind of instructions on cleaning. This is sort of just some characterization of what the post installation angle looks like. Um, we also have data sheets that we've developed to kind of help us keep track of when folks are going to these stations and what they're doing at the stations. You know, this is an important section if you collect a grab sample, filling that out, sending it into Stroud, we're taking grab samples, we're processing them, all in association with this DRWI. Shipping is paid, um, lab analysis is already paid. Um, then there's this spot to enter the data online um, through a, via a Google form, and then it displays all the data from all the stations. Okay. So anyone who has one of these stations via, via DRWI has access to the information for the other stations. Um, just you know, general maintenance, sensor was clean right there. Turbidity just drops right off. Okay. Again, same type of thing. Battery, that's a good battery output. There are batteries sagging. Okay. So you can supplement with extra, you know, Battery is a charger and a charger. So, you know, you if you don't get solar. enough solar coverage, you can either put a bigger solar panel on or rotate batteries. Well, okay. you, is it an option? I mean, you could just increase the sample time for sampling so it sleeps longer. You, know, you could, yes. If we're going, and that's a, we're going every five minutes. So, so you could data are being collected depending. every five minutes for this. Um, okay, so rating curves. So, ultimately, to really kind of talk about things more robustly you develop rating curves so you link depth you know your this is staff gauge but you also could have would have sensor depth here okay and then you link that to discharge so that once you've got this rating curve established then you essentially have continuous discharge data at your site okay you use that along with the TSS to turbidity rating curve Okay, once you have this developed, you have the relationship between TSS and turbidity, so you can infer TSS, total suspended solids um, based on your turbidity data. And then you have the chloride curve, where you're relating chloride to, con to conductivity. Okay, so you use this with this, and use this with this, to then talk about actual you know, amounts of material. So this amount of salt, this amount of sediment came through during this particular storm or this season. Okay. Part of the rating curve, you have to measure the profile of the stream or the depth. 
So that's another thing, and I don't think I'm going to get much into that, but we're mapping the channel so that we can predict wetted area, particularly during times when the stream is not weightable, and then all you have to do is measure velocity, get some estimate of velocity. It's going to be kind of coarse, but nonetheless, you can predict wetted area, go out and just measure velocity, <coughs> multiply velocity times wetted area, and you get discharge. Okay? Um, this is an hour, but it's actually like not much time to go through a lot of this. But um, so this is the stream discharge sheet that we've developed. So this is the full <coughs> kind of uh, you know proper way of measuring discharge. One of the proper ways where you're using like a flow meter, you're measuring uh, water depth, you're measuring velocity going across the stream at different points. You know, getting at least 15 across the stream. This is your neutral buoyant object, so if you don't have a flow meter or it's unweightable and you want to get some estimate of velocity, you use a neutral buoyant object float. This is, this is a, basically the same type of thing if you're just using a flow meter during unweightable conditions and you're just trying to get some estimate of velocity. Okay? So then that data sheet, so uh, measuring discharge, so developing a discharge rating curve. You know, the idea is to storm chase and get measured discharge at these different points so that your depth can then be linked to different levels of discharge. Okay? Or, or you can do it in one storm. Okay? Here's the idea in the channel. You measure at these different levels so that you know discharge at this depth, you know discharge at this depth, and then you can infer. Okay? So this is sort of linking this to this. Just this is basically like a description that would be in that is in the manual, just how to use the data sheet. Okay. This is sort of a preliminary rating curve. So you've got sensor depth, where you've got depth on this axis, you've got discharge on this axis. This is the sensor depth, this is the staff gauge depth, so there's an offset here. This is the equation for staff gauge height related to discharge. This is the equation of sensor depth. Okay. So you would just apply this equation to the continuous sensor depth data, and then you, then you have continuous discharge data. Same thing with turbidity and TSS, collecting grab samples across the range of turbidity observed at a site. Analyze those, and then they come into a rating curve. Same thing with chloride. Okay. Conductivity to chloride rating curve. Okay. So one of the things with the, all this winter t activity, you know, uh, exposure to salt and this and that, some of these sites are getting insane pulses of salt far beyond these, these certain levels. Um, you know, two to three hundred milligrams, you can see this isn't, you know, this is, this is going to be situational according to the stream. But, um, you know, you can see based on this relationship, 4,000 conductivity, 1,300 chloride. Here we're up at 35,000 conductivity. So these bugs in here are being hammered. Okay, um, these are just some plots of some of the stations that we're working with, just for frame of reference. Um, you know, hurricane run, this giant pulse. You know, and you see it comes in right at the beginning here, right when that, right that first flush of salt. You know, and it goes up to thirty-five thousand, and then right back down, and then it, then it dilutes, and it washes off, and then dilutes. You know. So, the last part is then taking those rating curves and applying them to the continuous data talk about loads. So we have this uh, calculator sheet um, where you plug in the equations that you've developed from your rating curve, plug in the data, the particular data that you're interested in, and run through it and calculate final loads. Some for whatever time period you're, you're wanting to um, investigate, and that gives you your loads. Okay, um, one of the, two of the other calculators we have, we, there's a discharge rating curve calculator so that you basically just 
the data on those discharge data sheets you enter into that calculator. It sort of is just a way to get past all of the kind of nuts and bolts that can happen with spreadsheet work. So it's a spreadsheet that's already formatted to develop the rating curve. I've got one minute here. So these calculator spreadsheets, um, I, I wish I'd put some, I kind of forgot, I wanted to put some screenshots of that discharge calculator in there, but I didn't. Um, there's also this uh, online forum that we're using for materials. You know, I'll upload the manual to there. There are guidance materials up there already, like a present, there are multiple presentations like this up there. The data sheets are up there. There's articles up there. And we do have some discussions up there. A lot of our discussions seem to still go over email because it's just so accessible. Um, okay. So, as I mentioned, Viro DIY outside of other, uh, uh, outside of DRWI, this Seesaw grant um, is available to use in Pennsylvania for coming to uh, groups to just talk about this type of stuff, workshops, whatever. Um, so that's something that is available. Consortium for Scientific Advancement to Watersheds, Seesaw. Okay. Um, so, and that's. Wow. <laughs> 